Mr. Trevor Potter. Thanks very much. Uh, this is a great report. Uh, the Campaign Legal Center has had a, a good working relationship with Justice at Stake for a number of years, and uh, I'm very impressed by uh, the, the uh, result that we have today and look forward to studying it more closely. Uh, it covers a number of important issues. Uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, the campaign finance side of this. Now, I have to say I almost didn't speak today because before lunch I was talking with Justice O'Connor and I told her I was going to speak on the public funding of elections. And she said, we don't need public funding of elections if we have merit selection. <laughs> and of course she's right. Uh, however, as she pointed out, we have a majority of states that haven't seen the light yet. Uh, and we have incredibly expensive races in a number of uh, those states. So what I want to talk a little bit about is, uh, not surprisingly for a lawyer talking about judges, the legal framework we're dealing with here because there is a uh, parallel to uh, winning the hearts and minds of voters on merit selection, a ongoing battle uh, in the courts and one that the campaign finance, the campaign legal center has been very involved in. Uh, there has been across the country a series of attacks on the various ways in which uh, we have attempted in those states with the election of judges to insulate them from the political process, to try somehow to bridge this gap between the notions that uh, Justice O'Connor spoke of as a fair, impartial judge and the demands of our election system, uh, which usually requires someone to be fairly strident and they aren't always able to uh, take the high road as uh, Chief Justice Jefferson did. So the push has been to uh, remove codes of judicial conduct uh, or at least to argue that they violate the First Amendment to the extent that they restrict what candidates can say uh, and to argue that campaign speech uh, ought to be uh, much more uh, uh, direct and controversial even in the election of judges. I noted in the report there's a quote from Justice Scalia saying that our decision uh, in the White case doesn't mean that uh, judicial elections have to look like candidate elections. But the push has been to say, well, they really ought to have uh, the, the same openness uh, to political debate, and that has consequences. But the most particular fighting has been over the campaign finance side and over the disclosure side. Uh, if you're going to have an uh, elective system, you obviously immediately face the question of, well, where do the contributions come from? And if you want to insulate judges uh, from the potential for conflicts of interest and from litigants uh, electing them to the bench, the sorts of issues that we saw in Caperton, you have to have some sort of alternative. And so North Carolina uh, has led the way in coming up with a campaign finance system for the election of judges. These sorts of systems generally uh, provide a way for small contributions to be matched uh, often on a multiple basis by the state so that if somebody can raise $100 from an individual, uh, the state will provide a match of two or $300. Uh, another way of doing it is to say that if individuals receive a certain level of private funding in small contributions, then the government steps in and will provide a general grant. Uh, this is something that we've seen in this country now for some 40 years in a range of races, but it is reasonably new to the uh, judicial election uh, world. This is running into a uh, legal challenge that comes out of the uh, elected, the, the legislative campaign finance system, but will also affect judges. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, held that one provision of the McCain-Feingold law uh, called the Millionaire's Amendment was unconstitutional in a case called Davis. And that was a provision of the law that said uh, if an individual spends more than a certain amount of their own money, then the uh, contribution limits to their opponents are increased so that they can compete. And the court said this was an impermissible burden on the First Amendment right of a candidate to spend his or her own money for campaign speech. 
The question that has raised outside of that context is, what do you do with uh, public funding systems that say, if a threshold is reached, either a certain amount of independent expenditures or a certain level of spending by candidates who are not in the public financing system, then the government will step in and provide additional matching funds when that spending threshold is triggered so that the voters will hear from both sides and so that the person who is chosen to participate in the public financing system will not effectively be completely outspent by somebody outside of it or by a third uh, party outside uh, group. That is a, a case now in the courts. The circuits have split on it. Uh, it is expected to reach the Supreme Court, and it clearly affects the, uh, the form public financing systems have taken so far. It is not, I think, insurmountable, but it is a mechanism that uh, states have used to limit the cost of public financing for the obvious reason that you don't need to spend $10 million on every state uh, justice race. You want the money to be available in those where there is a lot of money being spent on the other side so that both candidates uh, have an opportunity to speak and be heard. But if there is no real race, it's highly inefficient to give the people in the system $10 million each uh, when there's, there's not a, a – uh, a uh, real uh, battle. So that's the one issue that uh, is, is currently out there, and if we don't, if we end up finding that we can't have trigger provisions, uh, clearly uh, there'll have to be a look at how else to finance or, or how to design systems that are not going to be too expensive but still provide a alternative. The other issue out there is disclosure. As you heard throughout the uh, report, who is spending the money is a key question, and this battle is being fought out across the country. Uh, even after the Citizens United case, and for those who noticed all the headlines about corporate spending in Citizens United, there was a very important alternative or an additional holding, which was the court found eight to one that disclosure of campaign spending was constitutionally permissible and indeed desirable. But the pushback uh, across the country now is a series of suits saying, well, perhaps, but that depends on how you define campaign spending, and you ought to define it as only spending by a registered political committee and not spending by any of these outside groups. Uh, their funding should not have to be disclosed. And that's going to be a legal battle uh, again across the country because if you don't know who's spending the money, it's very difficult to uh, be able to correctly judge uh, the advertising you're hearing and understanding which interests it's coming from. 